So this morning, we're going to have a look at two Henrys, Henry V, Henry VI. Um, and like I just mentioned, we're going to be spending a lot of time in France because um, the thing about Henry V, or at least the thing about Henry V that I like most, is his part in the Hundred Years' War. Oh, uh, Zoom is updated, so it's doing all kinds of weird things to me this morning. This is cool. Um, oh, oh, oh. Hang on. Okay. Yeah. I just mumble to myself whilst I'm working out how that works. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, Alfred says we should do Holland for H instead of Haiti, but of course Holland is really the Netherlands, so we'd have to wait to N for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, after we finish the Kings and Queens, what are we going to do in modern history? It's going to take us a while to finish the Kings and Queens. I'll think about that problem when I get to it. <laughs> um, so, um, Henry V, he becomes king in 1413. Um, uh, taking over from his hat father, Henry IV. Um, he's not king for a massive period of time. He only spends nine years on the, on the throne. Unfortunately, he's going to die relatively young. He's going to be dead by the time he's 35, is poor old Henry V. But that doesn't mean he's not significant, because in many ways he is. Um, and the thing that I like to focus on with Henry V um, not so much what he's doing back at home in England, but what he's doing in France, because since the time of Edward III, if we do a little rewind here, if we go back, last time we had Henry IV, there he is fighting against the Welsh. Um, before him, Richard II, the poor young king fighting against the peasants. And then we go back to Edward III. Now, Edward III, of course, he started the Hundred Years' War, and since it lasts for 116 years, the war is still going on by the time we get to Henry V, so we can scroll all the way back, all the way back. Hello, Richard. Oh, hello, Henry. Hello, hello. We can come back to Henry V. So it's the same war, it's still going on. Now, there have been times of sort of relative peace during that, you know, the, the the massive battles of Edward III during Richard's uh, reign and Henry IV's reign. Um, there's still fighting going on in France, but it's, it's relatively calm, I suppose. Henry V is going to really kick this back up again. You know, he's really going to start um, pushing down into France and to take it over. And it culminates, or at least his greatest victory is at Agincourt, um, which we'll go into a little bit, bit of detail in a minute. Um, Harry is asking me, does he get burnt? No, he doesn't get burnt. Poor old Henry. No, uh, far less. Oh, oh, I see what you mean <laughs> because of my notes there. No, no, he doesn't get burnt. Um, now, we need to know a little bit about what's going on in France at this time. So France, by the time of Henry V, so 1413, um, it's divided between English lands and French lands but it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's France proper and then there's like other French states like Burgundy um, so it's a great big mess down there really uh, lots of different factions fighting against each other alliances being made and broken and all this kind of stuff um, now the king of France at this time is Charles the sixth now Charles the sixth poor Charles VI, is not quite right. He's not quite right in the head. Um, he's going through some difficult times with mental illness, is Charles VI. Um, he starts to get very paranoid. He starts to think that everybody's trying to kill him. Oh no, I will not put up with this. Oh no, I will fight back, says Charles VI. And so he will get into these crazy rages where sometimes he will kill his own soldiers and his own men uh, because he thinks they're trying to kill him but they're not. Um, he'll just start going crazy with a sword. At times, um, he will spend um, his time just running through his palace in Paris, um, just running down the corridors, outside, in and out, just screaming and wailing and making weird noises. And so his courtiers, the people, you know, the no lords and the nobles in the palace, they actually board up some of the doors and windows so he can't get out, so he can't lose himself by like running around and screaming too much. Um, a lot of the time, he doesn't recognize his own family. At one point, he asks his guard to please remove that strange woman over there, who turns out to be his own wife. And of course, most uh, significantly, perhaps, uh, for some periods, Charles the Shit Sixth unfortunately believes he is made of glass. Oh no. Now, can you imagine 
and thinking that you were made of glass. Glass is very fragile. To be made of it is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And so Charles gets himself kind of a cage, a, a, an armor, a, a suit of armor made out of like bars of a cage, just so nothing can bump into him and smash him. Because if something did bump into him, he'd just shatter because he's made of glass. So poor Charles, he's having some problems. Hmm. Problems that we'll see later in this lesson as well in the English Kings. But um, partly then, Henry decides that he's going to take advantage of this. He, you know, there's a mad king in France. Maybe he's not going to be up for a fight. Um, so there you go. Uh, Henry's also a bit greedy, I reckon. Um, there's no real need for him, some historians think, to go down to France and stir up more trouble. He could probably have been quite happy you know, where he was, but he seems to want to grab some cash. He seems to want to make a raid into France, you know, take, a, take over a couple of towns maybe, grab some, grab some money, uh, make a bit of name for himself, get famous maybe. Um, so he heads down to France with a relatively small army. Uh, we're talking maybe a thousand knights at the most, and maybe a few thousand peasants or at least foot soldiers. Um, you know, nothing that imp impressive, but a good army for a raid. You know, run in there, smash stuff up, nick some cash, come back home, that kind of thing. Oh, someone's asking who was the Mad King? Charles the Sixth of France is the Mad King. So down in France, we have. A man who thinks he's made of glass, who's in charge of the French armies, which means that the French armies probably aren't as effective as they could be. Um, and Henry's kind of taking, uh, he's taking advantage of this fact. Plus he wants some money, plus he wants to be a bit of a hero. He's a young man, um, you know, he's in his 20s, he wants to go down there and, you know, get a name for himself from fighting the French. And he does quite well at it, to be honest. Hmm. Um, so, the Battle of Agincourt kind of happens by accident. Neither side is particularly expecting uh, such a big showdown as we're going to see at Agincourt, but here's some pictures. Uh, we've got one here. Here's a, a modern represent representation of Henry V. Whoa, whoa, no, it's all gone tiny. Here he is um, from a film. Here he is, look, riding his beautiful white horse with his, uh, you can see the lines of Plantagenet there on him, even though he's not technically a Plantagenet anymore. Uh, still the lions of the English kings. Um, here we've got another picture showing, and it's a bit like the one behind me, showing the battle itself. Um, now the Battle of Agincourt is one which is quite famous in England. It's a, it's a pretty big battle in you know English history terms. Strangely, if you go to France, it's not so not so well known. It's not a very famous battle at all because, spoiler, the English are going to win this one. Um, so, um, the battle starts out, we've got to imagine Henry's army, they've been down in France for a little while now. They've been raiding, they've been pillaging, they've been stealing stuff, they've been fighting against you know, relatively small groups of French people. It's been quite easy, to be honest. But, they have, they're, they're just about ready to go home. You know, they've had enough, really. Um, people are starting to get sick. Whenever armies march around for too long, especially back in the medieval period, there's a real good chance that they, people are going to start getting sick. Uh, we've seen the pooing to death, haven't we? There's a lot of that going on. Um, and the reason for that is that being in, a, in an army, especially if you're an army that keeps on having battles, isn't very hygienic. We've got lots of men and women camping together um, for long periods of time. Uh, the food isn't great. Uh, you know, there's nowhere to wash for sure. So it's, you know, things start to get stinky, things start to break down, people start to get injuries and disease starts to spread. Um, we've also got some bad weather right now in France uh, during this period. Uh, it's very rainy. It's very, it's kind of warm and rainy. So a good uh, environment for bugs and diseases to spread in. Also, the English are running low on supplies a little bit. So they're basically ready to go home. But Henry decides to have one, one last hurrah before he takes his men, who have done quite well already, back to England for some rest and relaxation and to heal. Um, and so he decides to push on down uh, towards this place called Agincourt. Um, oh, a good question. Is that hair or a hat? I think in this picture, we're looking at a hat, like a floppy hat on top of Henry. Um, hmm. 
Uh, but I assume, I mean, our picture is showing us that he must have had pretty short hair because his, his neck is, is free of hair, isn't it? So I think we're looking at a floppy hat on a, on a very thin, thin haired head. Yes. Hmm. Um, uh, oh, uh, Monarch asks, are we going to look at Henry VIII next? No, Henry VIII takes a little while to, to come along. Um, we've got some Edwards and a Richard first and then a Henry VII before we can get to Henry VIII. Soon, a few weeks and we'll be there but not quite yet. Um, so along come the English army, this small kind of worn out English army, and there's trudging through the rain and, you know, the sickness and all this kind of stuff. And they come across a humongous a French army. We're talking proper big. Um, estimates suggest that the French army was at least twice as large as the English army, but possibly even larger than that. It, it's difficult with all these medieval battles. You'll, you'll read one historian and they'll say, oh yes, uh, there were only uh, a thousand English and there were 9,000 uh, uh, French. But then you might read a different historian, perhaps a French historian, who will say, oh no, there were basically the armies were the same size. Uh, uh, the French, they had a very good army, but uh, it was only little. Um, sometimes you hear, you know, there were six English guys and there were 15 million French guys. So it's, it's hard to you know, pin it down to actual numbers. You know, records weren't great back then. So, this smaller English army, we're pretty sure it's smaller English army, comes up against this much bigger French army. Now, the French army is made up of lots and lots of knights. Uh, knights being these heavily armoured guys on heavily armoured horses who are uh, trained in all aspects of warfare. Um, they are good at fighting on horseback with their lances. They are good at fighting on foot with their swords. Uh, they're also trained in you know, basic bow skills, plus the other things that knights need, including dancing, singing, and poetry. La, la, la. Um, you know, you've got to be the all-round all kind of guy to be a proper knight. So we're looking at quite a big army full of you know, all the best knights of France against a small army of knights from England. Um, now, the English, they come towards this... You know, there's, there's the French fort or castle up on the hill with all these soldiers in it, you know, thousands of soldiers, mainly knights, but not all. And the English, they decide to camp for the night a little way away from this castle. And the French look out and they think, ah, this little English army, they are obviously too scared. They are not going to attack us. They would never attack us in a million years because we are huge and they are tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, it's called the Battle of Agincourt because that is where this is going to be. Now, the English, they make their camp. It's rainy. It's grim. They're worn out. And the French, they're looking out and thinking, ah, these guys aren't going to attack us. They'll be gone by the morning. They'll just leave. But when the sun comes up the next day, the British, the English haven't left. In fact, they're in full ba battle order and they're advancing on the French city. So, the French, they send out their knights. Um, oh, where is Agincourt on a map? I'll have a look. I'll see if I can find you a map of Agincourt. That's a good question. Um, so, we're looking at... Here we go. Uh, let's have a look here. Hmm. Agincourt on a map. Here we go. We've got it on this one. Yes, it's not far from here, really. Here we go. So here we have England and France, and here we have Agincourt. As you can see, Henry's already been around, taking places down, having all these battles. Um, he's on his way home. You know, off to Calais, get on the ships, back to England home in time for tea, all of that stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, you can hear my dog in the background, can't you? I think she'll be quiet now, hopefully. Um, so, yes, this is where, this is the, the route that Richard has taken, and Agincourt is pretty much last on his list of things to do in France, you know, it's kind of an extra, uh, just before he pops off to the duty-free. Now, the English are advancing, the French, they send down their heavy cavalry, their knights, and the knights start to gallop. Now, Henry's picked quite a good 
area to fight in. We can imagine this big, wide, grassy field, kind of with like uh, loosely forested areas on either side. Um, uh, it's kind of an open ground. He himself has a bit of a hill, but not much. Um, and the French knights, they charge down from their uh, vantage point. Oh, hang on. I'm trying to make the map big. I don't know if it'll do it. Here we go. They, they charge down from their vantage point um, and <laughs> they smash, or at least they try and smash into the English lines. Now, the English, they have a couple of advantages. Yes, they have the smaller army, but it has been raining for a while. And as the French horses, as they start to gallop across this open field, it starts to get kind of churned up. You know, the first night's down there, all right, they just gallop across the grass into the, into the English. There's a great big back and forth and smacking about as you get in battles. But the second line of horses and the third line of horses and the fourth line of horses, they're starting to kick the ground up and it mixes with all the l recent rain they've been having and it ends up turning into this great sticky, muddy soup. By the time the fourth and fifth lines of horses are coming down, they're no longer galloping. They're kind of stomping their way through this quagmire. By the time the next lines of knights come down, they are getting fully stuck. By the end of the battle, the French knights will be sinking. Their horses deep into the ground will be sinking down. The knights will be falling off, and because they're dressed in full armour, they won't be able to pull themselves out of the mud, and they will get sucked down, and they'll be drowning in their own helmets as the mud goes over their heads. Uh, grim. But mud isn't enough to stop the French. Uh, the French still outnumber the English, but then Henry pulls out his secret super weapon, the weapon that no one was expecting, the weapon that had never really been used to this effect before. But we can imagine we've got the French knights and the English knights, they're battling away, you know, in the mud. And then, yeah, that's it. And then from the sides, up pop peasants, English peasants with, us, with this new technology or relatively new technology called the longbow. Now the longbow is a bow and arrow that is, well, longer than a standard one, I suppose. Bows and arrows have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, but well, thousands of years by this point. Um, but what, and this is usually seen as a Welsh invention, this, but our bows and arrows, they are really, really long. In fact, the one in this picture isn't particularly long at all. A proper long bow would be down to the ground and way above his head. So this is more like a standard bow here. But and um, the long bows that these peasants were using were different from normal bows. If you shot a normal bow at a guy in armor on a horse, it would probably bounce off. Yeah, it would probably feel quite ouch, but you know, it would probably bounce off. These long bows, it is said, and there is some question about this, um, if you fire a long bow at short range against a knight, it will go straight through his plate armor and straight into his skin, killing him. So all of a sudden, when you're stuck in the mud, all these peasants rise up around you and start firing these heavy bows that can punch through your armor. People are starting to drop like flies now. The French are in full panic. They can't really retreat because they're stuck in the mud and they're being constantly pounded by these longbows. Thump, thump, thump. Now, I've heard it described as one historian that maybe the longbows didn't actually kill that many people. You know, maybe um, our longbows are causing... Um, yes, a man did lose his head, didn't he? Yeah. Um, maybe our um, uh, the longbows, they're not actually piercing armour. No, it's unclear. Some people say they could, some people say they couldn't. Um, one historian reckons that even if it didn't pierce armour, um, if you were hit by a, a, an arrow from a longbow, it would have been like being you know, punched straight in, you know, punched really hard by a boxer. So even if it's not going through the armour, it's like being just pummeled and if you're being hit by these bows which could fire multiple times a minute um they would just it would feel like you were just being punched over and over and over again and it turns out that most of the french or a good 50 percent of the french knights they end up surrendering now a good question here from lord explosive what is chivalry because that's on my list isn't it now chivalry is the sort of moral code that underpins being a knight 
So knights are supposed to be chivalrous. It's, it's, it's a moral code. They're supposed to never harm a woman. They're supposed to never harm a peasant, you know, unless they are provoked or attacked by the peasant. Um, they're supposed to protect the weak, yeah, the peasants and the women. Uh, you know, back then. Um, kind of sexist, but that's the way it goes. Um, they're also never supposed to kill each other unless they, uh, you know, were in the middle of a battle. But at any time, if a knight surrendered, then they were supposed to be taken away and sort of used as captives. Um, you could never kill a knight. A knight could never kill another knight if they had, you know, surrendered, thrown down their, their weapons, all that kind of stuff. Um, so chivalry was all about being polite and gentle and honest, but also a good warrior, you know, to defend the weak, uh, you know, slay dragons, all that kind of stuff. Um, so chivalry is in full bloom at this point, and the French, so the French knights, they start surrendering in huge numbers, you know, hundreds of them throw up their hands, drop their weapons, ooh la la, take me away, let's, let's, let's sort of sit down and have a biscuit. So they're taken away by the English, you know, we can imagine there's still people fighting, you know, it's still a complete chaos, but more and more of these French guys are throwing down the weapons, they're being dragged off, and they're being sat down behind the English army. Um, the weapons are taken from them, and they're told, you know, sit down, be quiet, just wait for the battle to end. Now, chivalry states that if, you're, if you've been taken prisoner, you don't try and escape, that would be incredibly rude. Huh. I have been stolen, I cannot escape, that would be very, very rude. No, I will sit here and I will be quiet. So the French sit down, um, there's a few English guards to make sure they're not up to any uh, naughty business, and the French look like they've been defeated. But that's only the start of the French army, because following up behind are more knights, you know, another thousand odd knights. Behind them are thousands of men with crossbows, and behind them are all the peasants with their pitchforks. I mean, there's a lot of French still to come. Uh, the English have won, sort of. They've, they've won the first part of the battle, but, you know, they haven't, uh, they have not won the war yet. <clears throat> so... Um, <laughs> um, uh, some 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 shout outs here for uh, what was for for women in general. Apparently, I'm being told that women are not weak and they do not need to be defended by knights um, and uh, nor the dragons. Yes, um, there you go. <laughs> um, back then, it was a little bit different. Um, women were seen as as delicate things; they had to be looked after. At least noble women were. I mean, up until they hit you, I suppose. Mm. Um, they certainly weren't involved in battles. I, I suppose it should, it's worth pointing out, though, that during all medieval battles, there would have been a lot of women around. They might not have been fighting, but they would have been in the back lines. They would have been uh, running into the front lines often with you know, great big pails of water to give the men something to drink whilst they're fighting. Uh, they would have been taking away the wounded and the dead. Um, uh, so, yes, there would have been a lot of women around. And I'm sure every now and again... A woman picked up a bow and arrow and had a good go with it as well. Yeah, I'd be surprised if that never happened. Hmm. So it looks like the, the English have won the first part of the battle, but it looks like there's more coming. And it's this point that Henry V becomes a little bit naughty. Hmm. Now, the rules of chivalry say you must, if you, if you surrender, you must be looked after. But Henry... We're not quite sure. We're not, we're not sure if he starts to panic. We're not sure if the French do something that scares him. Um, we don't know if he just you know, decided this was a good move. But he turns around to his men and he orders that all of the prisoners be killed. All of these French knights, hundreds of them, you know, just sat on the grass at the back of the, of the battlefield, not doing anything. He tells his knights, kill them all. Um, what Henry's afraid of is that with this new French army that's coming in to fight, the, all these prisoners they might stand up and fight as well, and the English will be trapped. Henry has realized, you see, that he's in fact been so successful that there are now more French prisoners behind the English army than there are in the English army. Yeah, so he's outnumbered by prisoners. There's a, there's a limit to how many prisoners you can take, I guess, and still be safe. So he gives this order. Now, some of his knights, they say, no, we will not kill these prisoners. We are good knights. We believe in chivalry. Henry says, if you don't kill them, I will kill you myself, and then I'm going to kill them anyway. So get on with it. So there is a slaughter. All of the French uh, prisoners are executed there and then. And we're talking hundreds of men. Um, now, the French army that's advancing, 
they see this happening. They see all the French knights being killed. And this, we're not talking just knights here as well. We're talking some of the most important leaders of France. Now, the mad King Charles, he isn't there at the point, at this point. He's probably in his castle screaming. Um, but all of his second and thirds and fourth in commands, they're all killed, you know, by Henry's orders um, at this battle. The advancing French army that's come to relieve and you know, finish this off, it turns around. It goes back. It's like, well, we're not fighting in all that mud and we're not getting our heads chopped off. This isn't worth it. And so they retreat. And it's a great English victory. But at what cost? Um, often the Battle of Agincourt is cited as the time when knights finished. The last proper battle of knights. You know, medieval knights will never really reappear again. And there's two reasons for that. One is that uh, the battle is called Agincourt. It's spelt up here, Agincourt. There you go. Um, there are two reasons why knights don't ever really make an, a, an appearance after this. Number one, Henry's been very naughty and he's kind of spat on the rules of chivalry. He said, look, we're not going to be chivalrous. We're going to kill people. Who, who cares about the rules? Which puts everyone off, I imagine. Also, and probably more importantly, this is the first big battle when it's been proven that peasants, just normal Farmer Johns and Farmer Gileses, with a bit of stick and a few arrows, can kill a knight. Uh, before this point, the knight was pretty much invincible. The only thing that was ever going to kill a knight was another knight. You know, that's all very fair. Mm -hmm. um, but now, someone can, you know, some turnip farmer from Cornwall can stab you right up good. There's no point being a knight anymore, is it? Mm. So, the battle ends... It's a great victory for Henry. He, he manages to take back a lot of plunder back to England. And he's pretty much, they say, decapitated the flower of France. He's taken out all of the French leadership. So France doesn't really ever get to fight back for at least the next 13 years. Um, they're on the back foot. In fact, uh, Henry goes into discussions with the re representatives of King Charles and it is agreed that Henry can be King of France once Charles VI dies, which means that France and England will be united as one country. <gasps> now, this would be great. This would be wonderful. And in fact, it was very nearly great and wonderful, except for one slight hitch. Two weeks before Henry was supposed to become King of both France and England, he drops down dead. Hmm. Not going to happen. Um, oh, uh, that's a good one. So Jasper's saying uh, that his dad thinks that longbow strings can be removed and protected from rain, but not crossbow strings. That's, that would make sense too. Yes, maybe they are easier to, to use in the rain. Um, the crossbows, as far as I know, never came into play. There were something like... Um, 10,000 crossbowmen or something ridiculous in the French armies, but they never came into play, um, which is why some people think that that's maybe the, the, the problem of this battle. The French could have won it, but they just chucked a load of knights forward first, thinking that they'd defeat the English easily. If they'd sent maybe the crossbows and the peasants forward first with a few knights, you know, it probably would have been quite an easy win for the French, to be honest. But they were overconfident. You know, they thought, no, we'll send in we'll just hammer them out of the way. We'll, we'll be back in time for lunch. Uh, we won't have to worry about this. Um, a question there, what is a crossbow? A crossbow is like, uh, it's kind of like a basic mechanical bow. You put an arrow in a machine and you crank it back to make the arrow, taut, the, the rope taut, and then you, you click a trigger and it shoots out uh, an arrow. So it's kind of like a, an arrow gun. Yeah, maybe that's a good description of a crossbow. Mm. Um, uh, Asma is asking me, how tall is Henry V? I have no idea. I'm afraid. Um, but he was only 35 when he died, to answer Rukia's question. Okay. So he drops down dead two weeks before he's supposed to become, you know, official king of England, um, because that's when Charles VI dies, and it would have passed to him. Um, now, Henry himself, being a young man, he doesn't have anyone that he can directly uh, give his, his line to. He did have a son, but unfortunately his son died before he did. So he ends up giving his crown to a very young nephew of his, um, uh, his nephew being our next king in line. Now, it's unsure exactly why he dropped down dead. Um, some historians, or at least the traditional story, used to be that he got dysentery and he pooed himself to death, like so many others before him. 
classic pooing to death scenario. Um, although this is unlikely because it seems to have been a very sudden death and dysentery, pooing yourself to death, usually takes a while. We're talking months at least of getting steadily sicker and sicker and sicker. And there's no historical record of that. It looks like he was fine one day or, or at least one week and dead by the next week. So the chan uh, the sort of the other main hypothesis is that he got too hot he got sunstroke he was riding around uh, at a different battle in full um sunshine you know years later this is um he got overheated in his armor and he would have died as a result of that somehow you know the, the heat stroke got him and he just you know collapsed and died it's hard to tell we don't know for sure um what we do know though is that the next king in line is only 10 months old when he's about to take the throne. We're talking a baby king, people. Full on baby king. Here we are. And our next one is Henry the VI. Um, uh, you'll see here that for the first time we have something a little bit different. Um, we've got two sets of dates for Henry the Sixth, because he is not going to be king once, but he's going to be king twice, which doesn't happen very often. Um, so he takes over, uh, he gets the job of king at 10 months old when he, in 1422. Um, he will be king until 1461, which is a good long reign. He will then stop being king for a while until he gets it back for a brief spurt between 1470 and 1471. Uh, more on that in a bit. Now, whoop, let me have a look here. Uh, so, focus on Notre Dame, that brilliant, beautiful cathedral in Paris. Um, something very special happens there in 1422. Uh, Henry is dead, Henry V, uh, sunstroke, whatever killed him. Um, and his baby, uh, baby nephew takes over. He is the first and only king of England, is Henry VI, to be both king of England and France. Um, no other king were ever crowned both England and France. Um, and to be fair, Henry VI never quite took over the entirety of France. He got close, but never quite. Um, so, uh, but he, is, he, he has that claim to fame. And so because he's the king of both countries, he is coronated, I mean, given the crown, in both countries. He is coronated in England, and then he is coronated in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Um, now, he meet, we're in, in the cathedral. You can imagine this baby sat on the throne with a crown on its head, or probably sat in the crown, because crowns are pretty wide and baby's heads are pretty small, but I don't know. Um, maybe they put on like a, a fake baby crown just to, just to make a thing of it. Um, the reports from that day, though, say that there was great celebration and there were lots of English people there, but all of the reports from France, uh, or from the French people who were present, were mainly complaining about the food. They said that the English chefs were just awful and their food was terrible and, you know, they, they weren't as good as French chefs, which might be true. I don't know. Those of you who have eaten in France, you may agree or disagree. It's up to you, I suppose. Um, so he becomes king of this very, very old, early age and he continues on the wars. He's not much of a warlord himself. He's no Henry V. Henry V wants to be in battle. Henry VI, not so much. Um, he will be in battles for sure, but as, as we'll see, not, maybe not of his choosing. Um, and the start of his reign is pretty, pretty peaceful, fairly peaceful, let's say. Um, let me just uh, take a look here. Uh, oh. uh -huh. um, sorry. Um, so he's there and as he gets older, he starts to get a little bit, well, a little bit Charles the Sixth-ish, I guess. Um, he starts to lose his mind a little bit. Mental illness creeps in. And things start to fall apart. Um, but before we get to that, we need to talk about something that's happening in France, because Henry the Sixth, as wonderful as he is, and I quite like Henry the Sixth, he, things are not going to go well for him in the Hundred Years' War. Essentially, what Henry manages to do is lose the Hundred Years' War, um, which I suppose we can put in here. Because if we leave Henry V and Agincourt in particular, you know, France is beaten. France is now this tiny little section in the southeast of the country. Um, its king is dead. It's led by the Dauphin, 
uh, or the dolphin in English, who is, that's the name that we give to the second in command, you know, or the, the next future king of France. But he can't be king of France because, well, Henry VI is the king of France, and to be king of France, officially, according to French law, you have to be crowned uh, in the city of Reims. Uh, but this, this city has been taken by the English, so you're not getting in there, and so you're not going to be king. It's all looking pretty dire. Until an unexpected hero arises in France. Da, da, da. Uh, I'll put a picture of her up here. For those of you who want some women, here we go. Um, probably one of the most famous women from the medieval period. She comes along. Jeanne of Arc, oui, oui. Um, here she is with her banner of the French. Now, we could do an entire hour on Joan of Arc, but let's, let's try and put her into, into the context of our English kings here. Um, she uh, comes from a very little village called Arc, hence the name Joan of Arc. Um, it's nothing to write home about, but her family uh, are in a, in a troublesome spot. Um, yes, I can write her, I'll write her name up here, I'll put it on the list here. There we are, Joan of Arc. Um, now, Joan, her family come from, you know, just a, a, a rubbishy little peasant village, like most people do at this time in history. Um, they are, they spend most of their time in fear of the English. In fact, the English have been through and attacked and raided before. Um, so they're no fans of England, that's for sure. Um, but Joan, she's a, a quiet girl. She grows up, you know, in a very normal kind of uh household she's she's not special in any way until she starts having visions the angels talk to her the dead saints talk to her they have full-on conversations with her in her head um and this goes on for a few years you know telling her how to behave go to church do this do that all this kind of stuff until one day the saints and the angels they tell her that it's her job to save france she needs to go and take take back the land get rid of the english um, make things better. So she knows that she has to go and find the dolphin. The dolphin. She has to go and speak to him. She has to, you know, tell her that he she's got a message from God. She has to get across country. And now most of France at this point is controlled by the English, so it's not safe just to ride around, especially if you're just a young girl on your own. So she disguises herself. She cuts her hair down. She puts on men's clothes, and she rides out to find the dolphin. Now. Long story short, she ends up at the court of the Dauphin and she asks to see him. The guards say, no, that's ridiculous. You're some random girl with short hair dressed like a boy. Get out of our faces. Um, but she says, please, you know, I've been sent by God. Um, a bit like Mulan, indeed, yes. Um, and so the guards, they go and they talk to the, to the Dauphin and they say, look, this, this girl's here. She says she's got a message from God. Do you want to hear her? Probably the Dauphin would normally say no. But to be honest, by this point, he is desperate. He has absolutely no clue how he's going to defeat the English. He needs a miracle. And here's Joan of Arc saying she's got a miracle. So he says, sure, show her in, bring her in. Um, but he sets up a little trick for her, a little trap to decide whether she is really sent by God or not. He gets some random Joe and he, he gives the Joe all of his clothes and his great big crown. And he says, look, you dress up as me, the Dolphin. I'm going to go and stand in the audience and just like be one of the crowd. Hmm. She won't know. She can talk to you, not me. I don't have to deal with her. You know, if she is magic in any way, then she'll probably get, see through it. But she ain't going to. So Joan, she walks into the throne room and there's loads of people stood around, including the secret Dolphin um, up on the stage there or whatever. There's a. Uh, there's the man dressed up as the Dauphin, not the real Dauphin at all. And he says, welcome, uh, what have you got to say to me? And she looks at him and she says, I'm not telling you anything. You are no Dauphin, you are some imposter. And she looks around the crowd and she sees, you know, the real Dauphin who's dressed up as like a normal guy. And she walks up to him and she bows down low and she says, Dauphin, I have been sent by God uh, to help you and to save France. And everyone goes wild, of course, because it looks like uh, Joan of Arc really is capable of talking to the angels. Aww. So the Dauphin then has her tested. 
She is taken away by priests and bishops who poke her and prod her and ask her loads of questions. And then they come to the conclusion that yes, she can speak to the angels. So she is holy and we should give her something to do. And so the Dauphin, remember he's desperate at this point, he sends her to the siege of Orléans. Now, Orléans is an important city which the English own and the French have been trying to attack and trying to take down for months at this point. They don't let Joan join in the battle proper, but they let her wear armour and they let her hold the sacred flag of France, this magic, you know, holy standard. Great big flappy flag. And so she rides out to Orléans and she starts to encourage the men and she waves her flag and she tells them that God is with them and within a few days they have taken the city yeah from no chance to they've done it she then leads the the french army all over france just winning battle after battle after battle at one point ugh, she is shot and hit by a crossbow bolt which could have killed her but it doesn't miraculously she survives and keeps on waving her flag and the french army just keeps on winning defeat after defeat or winning battle after battle after battle the english are being beaten back now eventually the story of Joan gets a little bit darker because she is captured in battle by the Burgundians who then sell her for a great amount of money to the English who put her in prison and they try to find an excuse to execute her. They want to say that she's a witch, that she's not actually talking to the angels. She's talking to demons, demons in her head. <laughs> yeah. um, so they put her on trial, not a normal trial, a trial that lasts weeks and weeks and every day for sometimes up to 14 hours a day she has to go into a courtroom where she is questioned and shouted at and berated by sometimes upwards of a hundred bishops and clergymen so members of the church priests and the like english priests and french ones who question her try and get her to 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 mess up oh how old is she at this point well when she meets the dolphin i believe she's 17 i think by the time she's captured she's 19 something like that she's yeah we're talking a teenage girl here she managed to survive weeks of intense interrogation and never once does she give any sign that she is demonic only that she is pure and holy she can answer any questions any of the priests throw at her in a perfectly christian way so they cannot kill her because they cannot prove that she's a demon but then they look at the old rule book and they find a new law that says you're not allowed to dress up as a man if you're a woman and you're not allowed to dress up as a woman if you're a man so they say to her joan you either change your clothes or we will kill you now she refuses you know there are reasons for that but she basically refuses she says no this is how i dress now i wear these clothes i have this kind of hairstyle stop being horrible to me now the english they say sorry joan but you have been tried and you have been accused of dressing up like a boy therefore we will burn you to death Ugh. And they take Joan and they tie her to a stake and they do, in fact, burn her to death. Oh, tragic. Now, some historians say that this should never have happened. I mean, lots of historians say this should never have happened, but lots of them say it could have been avoided. Um, the Dauphin, he was given a, an opportunity to buy her from the English, to save her, but he didn't. He just left her. Um, the English themselves, within about 30 years, they had regretted this decision deeply. Um, and in fact, they, they helped to make her a saint. They, they issued a formal apology for burning this poor girl, which was a bit too late for her because she'd already been burnt to death. Um, so yes, there is a Saint Joan of Arc and it's the same one. She is Saint Joan of Arc. Um, uh, miracles are attributed to her. In fact, the French troops, many French troops swear that during World War I, Joan of Arc was there in the trenches fighting alongside the Germans with them, um, you know, coming down out of the sky with her angelic friends to smash up some German machine guns. There's, there's many tales of that. Um, uh, so yes, that's one of the reasons why she's a saint, because she seems to help France in the time of need. But her real importance during this uh, you know, we're looking at the English kings here. Um, her death, even though it was tragic, it led the French to this new sense of identity and this new sense of anger. And so within a few years, by the time Henry VI has lost, you know, his marbles, he has lost most of France. The French take it back. Um, and yes, so, you know, the whole Hundred Years' War thing kind of ended up with, yeah, not much happening really. 
France was belonged to the French at the start of the Hundred Years' War, it still did at the end of the Hundred Years' War. There you go. Now, to focus back onto Henry VI, though, we'll leave Joan of Arc alone. Um, unfortunately, Henry suffers from some kind of mental illness too. For most of his life, he doesn't. You know, like Charles VI, to be honest, these young men, these guys are completely with it. But as they get older, they start to, to lose it a little bit. Uh, um, King Henry's madness will swing between long, it's never quite as extreme as, as Charles's. He doesn't believe he's made of glass as far as we know. It seems to be long periods of depression, times when he will not see anyone, uh, where he has to sit in a darkened room, like literally a room with all the lights out, um, you know, sometimes just screaming at the walls, this kind of thing. Um, he starts to, yeah, he starts to not be able to be king anymore, basically, is the problem. Um, it comes and goes. He's not always you know, in a bad way. Sometimes you'll have these really bad periods where he's, you know, depressed and, and cannot do kinging, you know, can't do the kinging job. And sometimes he'll be perfectly fine and back at it, you know. Now, during one of these periods, whilst he is, he's going through a, a particular period of madness or what they would call madness back then, um, his cousin Richard decides to help him out. He says, don't worry, you chill out poor Henry. I will take over the country for you and I will act as the king. I will not be the king, but I will act as the king. Now, these guys, they come from different families. Um, Henry, like Henry V before him and Henry IV, they are from the house of Lancaster, um, whereas Richard is from the house of York. Hmm. Uh, oh, I like Joan of Arc too. Yes, yes. You, you, Joan of Arc is worth studying. The story I gave there was a very compressed version. It's far more impressive if you read the whole thing. Um, uh, but um, so we've got some people from the House of York and some people from the House of Lancaster. Now, this isn't Richard the uh, Third. Good question there, Rock. No, this is a relative of Richard the Third. Richard the Third comes a little bit later, um, but we can call him Richard of York. He is Richard Duke of York, um, but he never becomes king. This guy, um, he takes over the job, and he says, "Look, yep, yeah, Henry, you're a bit ill at the moment. It's fine. I'll take over things for you." You know, you just go lie down, son. Uh, so Henry takes some time off. Richard takes over the country. It's all looking good. Um, now, after a while, Henry comes back to normal. You know, his illness passes. He's okay. <laughs> yes, Jasper. <laughs> uh, Joan of Arc is in Bill and Ted's Marvelous Adventure, which is an amazing film. Um, maybe not the most historically accurate, but it is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, Henry's better. He's no longer ill. Richard then is supposed to step down and not be doing the kinging job anymore. But Richard quite likes the kinging job and he won't give it up. He says, no, look, you might go mad again at any time. I think I better keep this job. I think I better be king. Henry says no. And the two sides, they go to war. Now, the war is long and bloody, and, and we call this the start of the War of the Roses. Very good, Kit. Um, we're looking at the House of Lancaster versus the House of York. They both have roses as their emblems. Um, it is, oh, let me get this right way around, red for Lancaster, white for York. Is that right? I think so. Mm. Trying to remember my Tudor rose. Um, uh, the two sides, they're fighting against each other. Um, now, at one point, Henry, King Henry, is captured by Richard put into prison, kept out of the way. Richard takes over the country. But Henry's uh, not going to take that line down, or at least he's going to take it lying down. His wife isn't. His wife gathers her own army and goes into battle against Richard, defeats Richard, kills Richard. Henry comes back. Huzzah! Everything's going well. Um, but things are not looking rosy. Um, Henry May has been rescued by his woman. That's two impressive women, at least, that we've had today. This is good. Um, uh, they're starting to appear into appear in history more aren't they um but uh the boars go on there's battles here and there i mean we're, we're not going to focus on the war of the roses in, in its own uh in its own way we're going to try and keep the focus on the king still but we're looking at lots of battles sometimes the yorkists win sometimes the lancastrians win um it's a terrible mess um now in 1461 henry suffers another defeat, this time against Richard's son, Edward. Now, Edward will take Henry, um, or will defeat Henry, and will take the crown, becoming King Edward IV, who we will look at next time. Um, but you'll notice that Henry comes back, 
because the Wars of the Roses, they continue, they keep on going. And then are we ready for the rewind? Um, Henry ends up defeating, um, because Henry runs and hides in a bush or something, probably not a bush, probably you know, a nice house somewhere. He hides in a house, he gathers his armies back up, he comes back, he defeats Edward again. Edward um, loses, has the crown taken off him, he is hit, Edward's turned to run away now and go and hide somewhere else. Um, and Henry becomes king again. But as you can see, not for long, he becomes king in 1470, loses his crown again in 1471. And for Henry, that's now, uh, that's final. Because Henry um, will be captured again in battle by Edward, who will again become Edward VI. So he gets two dates as well, as we'll see. Flip-flop, flip-flop. Um, and Henry VI will be put in the tower by Edward, the Tower of London, and he never comes out. Now, by this point, he's a fairly old man. It could well be that he just dies in there of old age, you know, illnesses, complications, poos himself to death like so many others before him. We don't know. Um, uh, people suspect that Edward had him killed, but we really don't know. If he did have him killed, it certainly wasn't like, you know, a big display. You know, there are rumours that he had his head chopped off, but there are also rumours that he didn't. We just don't know. Um, he goes in the tower. He doesn't come out. Poor Henry. That is the end of him. Um... Now, he dies, and I'm not sure how you're going to count Henry here. Um, some people say he was a very good king because he was, he was good and kind. Um, yes, he lost the wars in France, but it was really because he was a bit of a kind guy, people say. He spent a lot of his money on his friends and on the peasants. He was a particularly religious guy. He would you know, spend loads of money on making churches and giving food to the poor and all that kind of stuff, which is a really nice thing to do, obviously. But if you're the kind of guy who likes a king who's good at wars, he ain't so good. He lost France. He, you know, got into this War of the Roses nonsense. You know, maybe if he'd been a bit more firm and just killed all those Yorkists, the rest of history would have been different. Um, either way, when he died, the people of England were genuinely sad. Um, he later, just like Joan of Arc, had miracles attributed to him. People who pray to King Henry VI have their illnesses cured miraculously. Um, people who were poor find money after praying to him. And so he was made a saint, a, a heavenly you know, soul by the Catholic Church. So he goes down in history as being a very good man, but maybe not a very good king. Yeah, he was good to the poor. He was good to the people of England, but he wasn't so effective. He did you know, he, he lost the war against France and he ended up, you know, starting a civil war. I'm sure he didn't mean to, but he ends up, you know, the War of the Roses will continue until uh, through the next two kings that we're going to look at. We're going to look at Edward IV. We're going to look at Richard III. And it's going to be a lot of years of strife for the people of England, unfortunately, um, as, you know, civil war descends and Red Rose fights White Rose. Um, and there you go. So I can see we've got we've got a lot of people giving star ratings here. Let's see. We've got a lot of four stars, um, two stars for being nice. Oh, dear. Uh, Joan of Arc is getting a few stars, though. I mean, she's not even a king of England, but you know, by all means, give her some stars. Four and a half stars here. Uh, three and a half for Henry VI. Uh, all down to three stars from Captain Toad. Ten stars from Kai. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, Zaya is giving... Uh, let me see if I can read this number. Uh, 23,456,789 uh, stars. That's a lot of stars. Uh, that's, that's a big bag of stars, that is. Um, oh, only two stars from Eliza. Interesting. Okay, so a bit of a mixed opinion of our Henry here. 100 stars from Zach. <laughs> so I quite like Henry VI. I, you know, from baby to the grave, he's king and he does it with a bit of style you know he manages to defeat mental illness he manages to um you know lose france gracefully at least um but you know maybe not the most effective warlord i think we've seen two very different kings here today henry v warlord who sort of blazes his trail through history and then you know dies young and then we've got henry who kind of plods his way through history um being kind of a nice guy but maybe not so effective there you go mm. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Tomorrow in geography, we are going off to Haiti. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to ancient Egypt. That'll be quite fun. 
uh, pointy buildings et al. Um, and then we are going on Friday, we're going to have a look at the myth of Isis and Osiris, or at least a myth of Isis and Osiris. So it should be quite a nice week. Um, I hope you're all doing very well, and I will see you all, hopefully, tomorrow. Adieu. Oh. It doesn't seem to want to end. Oh no. Oh, interesting. How do I end it now? <laughs>